on this episode of Life in a Tide Pool. To find out if sea stars really have eyes, why you won't see many sea stars in the tide pools anytime soon, and the best place to find seashells while exploring the beach. Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Casey Eunice and today we're going to be exploring the tide pools in and around Shaw's Cove, California. Shaw's Cove happens to be one of my favorite beaches and tide pools to explore. I'm standing on the north tide pool here at Shaw's Cove. Shaw's Cove has two excellent tide pool locations. One of the reasons I like Shaw's Cove, it has such a wide diversity of life. For example, off to my right over I have the south section it is categorized by this nice, flat, low bench. Loads and loads of animals. A lot more anemones, really big anemones. A lot of urchins. This north section that I have on my left over here is categorized by more of these deep channels and run channels where water surges through. Different type of life that we see on the south section. North section has a lot more algae, has a lot of the rock weeds sitting on the rocks. A lot of different rougher terrain different types of animals, and overall a great tide pool location. I invited a colleague of mine, Daniel Zacharel, to help explore and identify some of these fascinating marine animals. I, I want to look at this channel that I have right in front of me. Now what do we call this right here? This is called a surge channel, and it's a location where uh, the velocity of the water is going to increase because the water is going to be forced through a very small space right. and literally surges up the channel. And, um, pro and creates all these uh, tide pools in a region that's otherwise considered really a high tide zone. So I see a lot of the animals may be indicative of a mid or lower tide zone simply because there's more water here. That's right. The geography, the channels, allowing this to occur. That's correct. Yeah, and you can see that the moisture, while this is really dry and has been dry for hours, this is still a nice moist crack with lots of anemones. Right. And we could even see uh, urchins and snails and uh, hermit crabs uh, occupying these surge channels. This is the, uh, the higher tide zone, we'll call it the upper tide zone, right? And I see this very small animals I think are indicative of this upper tide zone. So I have this small buckshot barnacle. Yes, that's right. But I also see all these little black little dots down here. Yeah. What are these? These are little periwinkle snails and um, they're pretty interesting. They can graze on algae. They use their rasping tongue-like organ called the radula to scrape the algae off of the rock. Right. And it, as it turns out, they can also feed on larval barnacles. So as the barnacles are setting um, on this rock, some of them are going to get grazed on by these uh, periwinkle snails. Snails are commonly found in all zones of the tide pool. In general, snails are larger the lower in the tide pool they live. The next snail we found was the very common black turban snail. Yeah, so this is an intertidal snail that's, oh, and look, there's one of our, oh, a couple of limpets, couple of limpets living on, on the snail. snail. Okay. okay, so this is a gastropod snail, and it's living up in the upper intertidal areas. It's really common in Southern California intertidal areas, and right. its name is Chlorostoma funebralis. Okay. Yeah. So it, does he eat algae or is he predatory? No, it's a, it's a, it's a grazing snail, so it's an al algae eater. And this type of snail is called a top snail. When we put it down, you can see that um, the whorls um, kind of come up above right. yes. the head region yes. and the foot region. The predatory snails, the ones that are um, not herbivores, that are carnivores, they're going to have a different body shape. And once we find one here in the intertidal areas, we can talk about their body shape, but they're more elongated. We made our way to the northern tidal area to see if we can find an example of a predatory snail. One of the things that I love about this place over here is that it has these great big channels that the water just rushes through over here. So what types of benefits can animals have by living on the sides of these channels here? Well, for one thing, the channels provide lots of shade. Okay. And um, so that means that animals can live a little bit higher in the intertidal than they could otherwise if they're, if they were exposed to the sun continuously. But also they benefit from those really fast velocity waters moving past. Um, it delivers more water per unit time and that means they can feed more if they're filter feeders. So the filter feeders will take food out of the water column. So more water rushing by obviously the more food I have. Food available. The bigger right. I can get, better I can survive. So Absolutely. 
Other question, since I have a lot of water rushing through, I have to be able to really hang on to that rock. Animals that you're going to be seeing living in these surge zones are going to be really um, specialists at, at clinging to the rock. I see my mussels really good. That's right. I see barnacles. That's right. You might actually see crabs down there, but they're going to be really hiding in the cracks and crevices um, during the strongest surges. I yep. see a no, I don't see any snails in there. They'd probably, the snails would probably get washed away in here, right? You know, some of the snails could, could um, cling to this rock, but they're probably going to favor the tide pools. You will see limpets down in these um, surge channels as well. Ah, because they can cling on to rocks. They can really cling on to rock very well. And they have that nice body shape that helps them. That actually is a very good shape for the hydrodynamic environment they live in. Right. right. You don't see long uh, limpets coming um, way off of, of the substrate. You see them um, sort of flat. I'm, I'm at one of the other channels here in the northern section over here, and right before me, you can't see it clearly from home, but there's this massive, massive colony of sandcastle worms right under here. So Danielle, why are the sandcastle worms here? Why do they live, choose to live here? Well, once again, it has to do with being located in a surge channel. They're taking advantage of that high velocity water that's gonna be delivering lots of food. They're suspension feeders, so they're um, trying to grab as much food as they can that's racing by. I see a whole big colony next to each other, and I always see them together. Yeah. Why is that? They're gregarious settlers, and that means that the larvae, when they're settling and they're picking their um, habitat, are actually going to use the scents of their um, other, of others of the same species to figure out a good place to live. And they settle down right next to one another, and the thinking is that this is a great for when they're reproducing because they're free spawning um, animals and in this way there's a much greater chance that sperm and egg are going to meet if they're right. right next to one another. Very or similar to what we saw in the gooseneck, gooseneck barnacles clumping together gives them an advantage we think in actually settlement and uh, distribution, right? That's correct and the other thing is that if an adult is living in a particular area and they're sit and you're getting a really strong um, um, odor trail from a, a, a from a huge colony that probably indicates that the hydrodynamic conditions are, are perfect for you to live in that environment and so right. it's a, a great way to select a good habitat. I want to take a moment and talk about how visitors can enjoy the tide pools even if it's the high tide or the tides coming in as we're seeing behind here we're actually probably about I don't know it's getting pretty high, right? In a lot of instances in these surge channels, we have these pockets where these shells collect. So the high velocity of water is going to aggregate and collect these shells up over here. These little aggregations and collections of shells, absolute treasure troves of, of information and things that you can see. That's right, a lot of stories to tell in There's, all these shells. Danielle, that's absolutely right. And so if you look through these shells a little bit, you actually can see a lot of the animals you can expect to see, maybe not live animals, which actually see the animals. What do you see here? Where do we start? So, okay, so go ahead. one of the things that we found um, in, our, in our treasure hunt is we found, um, this is an old mussel shell, and we found evidence that um, it might have died um, due to a, a drilling predatory snail because we found a perfect little beveled drill hole um, in this shell that indicates that it was preyed upon. And actually, here's another mussel shell with that perfectly beveled drill hole also. And likely candidates are all of these whelks. These are um, predatory snails. They have a, um, a drilling radula that they use, which is a, a rasping tongue-like organ. And that drilling radula can actually drill a perfect beveled uh, hole and um, access the flesh of the animal underneath their shell. How do these predatory whelks here get the actual material out of this, the, uh, the mussels to eat? How does that happen? Well, so once these predatory whelks drill that hole into the shell, they can insert a long feeding proboscis, which is sort of like a straw-like structure that they can insert in. At the end of the feeding proboscis is their radula, and that's that rasping tongue-like organ I've talked about. And right. they can actually rasp the flesh away and draw it into their um, mouths that way. So that radula, the tongue thing, has got to be pretty long sometimes to reach all the cavities of the actual shell. Yeah, absolutely. Pr uh, predatory whelks can have radula. Well, the, it's the proboscis, actually, proboscis, right. that can extend um, far into the animal. They're often uh, many body lengths longer than the actual uh, whelk. So it's amazing. That yeah. is amazing. And one of the things I want to show you is that it's really easy to tell a predatory whelk from a grazing whelk okay. from the general body shape. So these are called top snails, the grazing whelks. Or, or, I'm sorry, the grazing snails are called, are called top snails. And when you place them down, you can see that the whorls are kind of on top of their body. 
These predatory um, snails, on the other hand, are called whelks, and they have this elongated body. Rather than sort of a circular opening, they've got a more elongated opening oh. here. Yeah. So as you said, it's more this way for the whelks, and then top-wise for top snails. So that's, that's a great correct. way to remember that, that's right? That's right, yeah. So these are great, great examples, but I yeah. see a lot of other stuff in here. Oh, so. there's a treasure trove. Let's just start looking. Let's see what we can find. So this is a curiosity. This is a... Um, a great example of a really unusual snail. It doesn't look like a snail, does not, it? Not at all. What does it look like to you? It looks like a worm or a big long worm sting. Yeah, well, so this is actually called the tube snail. Okay. Um, its scientific name is Serpulorbis squamigerus. Okay. It is a snail that lives in a, in a worm tube-like structure. It builds this tube just as if it were a shell, but has cemented itself to the rock. Rather than build what a typical shell would look like for a snail, it builds this long tube. And then it's, um, it's forced into a position where it can't pursue its prey or its food item anymore by crawling around. Right, so it's pretty much stuck to uh, some sort of you know, rock or something like this. That's and right. Once it's there, it's done. So, yeah, so how do you think? Suspension feeders, yeah. filter feeders. Yeah, how do you think they feed? Any ideas? I would expect it to be normal filter feeders. They actually have some of the uh, body parts and morphology goes up in the water and actually catch certain of the plankton. Well, it's crazy. Actually, what they do is they create this um, mucus um, net or web, okay. kind of like a spider web in a way. All right. It's this big mucus um, um, net, and they're suspension feeders, so they're capturing whatever encounters that mucus net. And when it gets full enough, they actually draw it back into their mouths and literally feed on their mucus glob. It sounds really <laughs> appetizing, doesn't it? It sounds almost effective. I yeah. bet it's, this is a pretty <laughs> interesting a, adaptation for them to feed in this environment. Well, this is an interesting one. Look at this. This is a volcano <laughs> limpet that is totally fouled with algae. Isn't that interesting? So the volcano limpet, we can tell because it's got actually the hole up on top over here. Yeah. So the other thing, it's got the algae growing on it here. And so I'm looking at this. And so to me, that is a very big disadvantage for this animal. It creates a lot of drag to have all of these fouling organisms living on your shell when you're an organism that is clinging to the rock with tremendous wave force. That's right. So the wave's going to have a better opportunity to knock you off, and therefore, once you're knocked off, you're dead. You're dead. That's right. Tetraclida. Oh, and living on top of mussel shells, <laughs> right? Or, yeah. I guess, dead on top of mussel shells, but... So that's actually a great question. So how do... When I'm looking at a barnacle, how do I know if it's alive or dead? Well, okay, so you can look inside of... Um, we mentioned that they have this plate, they, these plates that they live within. Right. And typically, if it were alive, it would have a, an additional two plates on the inside. You could see... They're called the operculum. They actually use those two plates to close themselves up. So inside would be where the animal is living. I and see. if you're seeing a big blank hole, then um, it's not living. Many tidal animals, including the sandcastle worms, mussels, barnacles, and sea stars, have several life stages. Most start off as eggs that morph into larvae. Their larval forms drift in the ocean currents and will settle only when the conditions are just right. One question you might ask is, how did these sandcastle worms and barnacles get here in the first place? And where did they come from? Tracking a larval form of a tidal animal is almost impossible. There are, however, methods to track where the animal came from. My research group is really interested in studying the youngest life stages of marine species. These are called uh, larvae, and we're interested in understanding how far they move away from their birth location so that we can build a better understanding of how connected populations along a coastline are by immigration of these youngest life stages. Okay. And so we're taking advantage of the fact that snails and fish they form calcified ear stones. In snails, they're called uh, statiliths, and fish, they're called otoliths. Right. And they um, build these ear stones through their entire lives, from the moment they're born until they um, settle down into their adult habitat, and then even into adulthood. And right. as they build their chemical um, structure, or as they build these calcified structures, they're incorporating the chemistry of the seawater into those calcified structures. And uh, as they move through parcels of the ocean that have different chemistries, they're effectively recording their travels. Um, it's like a, a right. bit of like a flight recorder. Right. So we can use the chemistry of these structures to uh, estimate um, how far they've moved and uh, where they came from. Tide pools, like most all other natural environments, have certain natural patterns. These natural patterns can be based on either physical factors or biological factors. Some patterns are very easy to see, while others are not. One of the easier patterns to observe in a tide pool 
but much more difficult to explain, is a simple open area on a rock. So here's a, a question. So I see open space here in this rock. So what, how does this open space materialize? What causes this open space in this type of environment? You know, there's a couple of things. Um, one of the primary um, generators of open space in this um, mid to low intertidal area is the uh, keystone predator, Pisaster ocratius. It will come in and feed on these mussels, and it actually constrains the mussels to, um, it sets their, their lower tidal limit, actually. And so um, as we get lower and lower, we see that they get cleared out by, um, by the Pisaster. But there's another possibility, and that is that um, during big storm events, we can get some pretty ferocious waves crashing, and there's a lot of wave force acting, and it can um, operate to tear large numbers of mussels apart in a group. Um, they basically tend to, wash them away down. That's right, yeah. Okay. So they tend to cement to the rock using um, bissel threads, but they right. also cement to one another. And so when they create um, a solid patch um, and um, one gets dislodged, it creates even more drag so that eventually you can have a whole group of them getting dislodged. So that's why we see these big open patches here in these rocks, because of primarily the big wave action that we see coming it, through. Well, it could be pro it could, a but combination it could be of uh, pre stars. predation and um, wave action, right. On today's episode, we wanted to talk about and show you one of the most fun and common animals to see in tide pools. We're talking about sea stars. But if you've noticed, we haven't seen any sea stars here today. In fact, you probably won't be able to see stars anywhere along the California coast. The reason for this is because of a disease that has affected almost all of the sea stars on the Pacific Northwest. This disease is called a sea star wasting syndrome. The sea star wasting syndrome is a disease that affects several species of sea stars. The disease is particularly harmful to Pisaster ochraceus, or commonly known as the ochre sea star. The disease was first noticed in June 2013 in the Olympic National Park in Washington during a routine intertidal survey. The wasting syndrome has spread rapidly and has impacted most all locations on the North American coast, ranging from Alaska to Mexico. Areas affected usually have a 100% mortality rate. Scientists speculate that the cause of the disease is related to a virus or a bacteria found in the water or possibly in the animals that sea stars eat. Scientists also think that warmer water temperatures may have something to do with the disease. What's going to happen to this little area here when I remove this apex sea star predator from this environment or this niche? What types of things are we going to expect to see? So one of the things we might predict happen is that the mussels will gain more of a stronghold. So as they recruit, as their young recruit to this area, they're going to be able to monopolize this habitat. And they're such good space competitors that it probably means that organisms like the anemones and a lot of the algae are going to be displaced. And we're going to see a, a shift in the community diversity to organisms that can live in and among the mussels, as opposed to these other um, space occupiers that the mussels will displace. Right. There are three sea stars commonly found in tide pools such as this. There are the ochre sea star, the bat star, and the brittle star. Now we know that the ochre sea stars have been severely impacted by the sea star wasting syndrome, so chances are you're not going to have great success seeing them anytime soon. They will rebound, and so one day we'll, we'll see the, the, the masses of sea stars that we used to see here. But until then, not a good chance of seeing those ochres. Bat sea stars, they tend to live a little bit deeper in the tide pool area, so you have to come at really low tide to see those. Brittle stars, they're a little bit smaller and they, they hide under rocks, even more difficult to find. So even though we didn't see any sea stars here out in Shaw's Cove, there's plenty of great places for you to go see sea stars and maybe even you know, touch them. One of my favorite places to go see sea stars is the Santa Monica Pier Aquarium. So here we are at the touch tanks of the, the Santa Monica Pier Aquarium. And here with me again is I have actually Jenna. Yes. Jenna's gonna tell us a little bit about some of the sea stars we have in this tank. Mm -hmm. I know before I touch the animals over here, there's some safety protocols I have to follow, right? Yes, there is. We call it the two finger rule. We just ask that you pet gently with two fingers instead of poking. Um, we think that gentle hands make for happy animals. Very good. 
Okay, so I'm actually going to go ahead and, and touch some of them in, in here like that, right? Absolutely. So I'm not allowed to pick up the animals, but I can touch them with my fingers, right? Absolutely. Awesome. So this one appears kind of bumpy knobby here, mm -hmm. right? So what is this one here? Well, it's so aptly named. That is a knobby sea star. <laughs> okay. This one over here, what's this one here? Mm -hmm. This, I believe, is a short spine sea star. Okay. And this one's very different. It's kind of like webbed feet between it over yes, here. Yes, this that? one is very different. This is called a bat star. Um, they get their name because of that webbing between their arms. Right. And they wouldn't typically be in this tank because they are actually one of the prey that these other sea stars would try to eat. Uh, so I just thought sea stars eat mussels and clams and barnacles, but they'll yep. eat other bat stars? They will eat other sea stars. Um, the sunflower star is one of the most notorious yes. for eating, especially brittle stars. Uh, but they are scavengers. Basically anything too slow to get away from them, even dead material, they will eat it. If I'm looking at the tide pools, what are some of the more common sea stars I'm going to see in the tide pool area? In a tide pool, one of the more common ones would be the ochre sea star. That is one that you can find pretty much everywhere. So are there ochres in here? Yes, there are. This is an ochre right down here, okay. including these guys over here. Uh, so I noticed the different colors. So mm -hmm. how do sea stars get their colors? You know, that's an interesting question. It may just be based on warning colors. This knobby sea star, mm -hmm. for instance, over here, you see has this really beautiful blue color. Right. And just like in the wow. wild, there are lots of animals that have bright colors as a warning because they themselves are toxic or poisonous. And so it's a benefit to other animals to mimic that and display those bright colors to kind of ward off the animals and hope that they think that they're venomous as well. What do the sea stars eat in this tank here? How do you feed them? In this tank, we feed them fish heads. That is their favorite <laughs> food. And we actually like to put the food, we call it putting it in their armpit. We just put it right down here. Nice. They'll grab onto it with their tube feet and then they bring it down to where their stomach is. I know from some of my research mm -hmm. that sea stars have more than one stomach sometimes. Is they do. Right? Yeah. Uh, some of them have two stomachs, one right on top of the other. What are some of the adaptations that a sea star has to be able to live in one of this intertidal, really rough area that we have here? In the rough area, their tube feet, I think, are one of the, the biggest adaptations that they would use uh, more commonly. They help them to walk, they help them to grip onto rocks tightly when there's wave action, and they use their tube feet to open up those, those muscle shells that most other animals can't get into. Right. So the tube feet have to be very, very strong, or we just have like thousands of them? Huh? They have a lot of them, and they're also very strong. They can right. pry open a muscle shell. It takes them about an hour, but they can actually pop them open. Other interesting question. So I know we only can keep certain amount of types mm -hmm. of animals in this tank at a time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the bat stars. Mm -hmm. What else can I not keep in with the sea stars here? With these sea stars, we would not be able to put any clams, any mussels, um, anything like that. It would be it's pretty much an open buffet for them if they were to put, right. get in the same tank with them. And that's primary because they can move. Yes. They can, they can move to capture these other animals. Exactly. Even the sea urchins, the sea stars would eat those as well. Really? Mm -hmm. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, do sea stars have eyes? So I had the opportunity to visit Danielle in her lab the other day, and this is some of the information she provided. I always get asked, and so people look at the tips of these sea stars, you know, yes. and it has what's what I think is eye. That's correct. So they, they do. They have what's it's an eye spot. And if you look very carefully um, at, on the edge of um, any of the arms, you can see a little red dot um, nestled in between the tube feet and the spines that are at the end of those arms. And that's able to sense light. It can't actually form images. Why does it need to sense light? What, what advantage does that have? One thing is that a sea star um, doesn't necessarily want to um, be caught out um, in the blazing sun, and so it might seek shelter. And so that might be a way for it to uh, um, establish whether it's in a shaded area or a sunny area. Right. And, um, Over there, I see that little guy. Yes. That is a... This is a brittle star. Yeah, I'm going to let you pick him up. Ophiroid. Yeah, and you'll notice that they... So he moves very fast, his arms. Are... They do, and actually their arm. We say that their arms are ambulatory. They actually use their arms for movement. Unlike the, sea, the, um, the other sea stars we were looking at earlier, they actually use their tube feet for movement. The arms are not considered ambulatory, so they're not actually mm -hmm. for helping them move. Um, so you mentioned tube feet. So right. do all sea stars, ha sea stars have tube feet? They do, actually. It's part of uh, what's known as their water vascular system, which is unique okay, to the sea stars. Go. Yeah, so there, here's our... Um, look how fast his arms are moving. Yes, that's right. So it's very much faster than these guys over here, right? Absolutely. So can, can he crawl? Um, yeah, they actually can crawl, and um, they're really uh, like, like quite mobile. 
Um, and the okay. sea stars are moving at a much slower, um, they're, they're, they're able to crawl as well, but they're moving at a much slower pace. And they're using those um, tube feet, um, which are part of their water vascular system. If you turn a sea star over, you can look in what are called the ambulacral right. grooves, or the grooves, the tube feet grooves. And you'll see the tube feet protruding from those um, grooves, and that's what they're actually using to, um, to propel themselves. Some sea stars have the ability to regenerate a lost arm. This process may take a few months or years, depending on the species. On occasion, sea stars may regenerate multiple arms, resulting in an animal that has more than five arms. Well, that's about all the time we have for today's show. I hope you learned a lot about sea stars and sea snails. I hope to see you again next time. Remember, when visiting any beach or tide pool, know the local rules and regulations. Look, but don't touch, and absolutely no collecting. Human impact is one of the leading causes of animal mortality in our local tide pools. Our beaches and tide pools will thank you for it. Thank you.